Well, hey, God bless you guys. Um, my name is Andy Hayner. Uh, I have a ministry called Full Speed Impact. Um, I came to know Christ when I was 19 years old. Um, I had a, a family that was a decent family. My dad was in the military, so he was a little bit more autocratic and not very emotionally present kind of thing. And it, when he was emotionally present, it was anger. <laughs> you know, but he was a good guy, um, you know, in general. Uh, so I didn't really have a whole lot of excuses, but uh, there was a time in my life where I was high every day before my feet hit the ground for about six months in a row. And partly it was because I had come to a point where I had been successful in everything that I was attempting to do. I had friends, I had girlfriends, I had parties, I had good grades. I was the voted the permanent team captain of the football team as a junior and we won the national championship and uh, you know but on that ride home from winning, you know, going 15 and 0 and being the team captain, this feeling comes over me. Oh, this is my junior year. I got to come back again next year, do the same thing all over again. You ever been so focused at trying to succeed at something, then you succeed at it, and then you get off the top of the ladder, and then you're right at the bottom of another one. You got to start all over again. And I started having that. I didn't realize it at the time, but I believe God was speaking to me. He just kind of came over me and showed me the shallowness and emptiness of life. And that's really the way I felt. I felt like life was empty. And so I, was, I stopped... You know, I started seeing, you know, it was difficult for me to get to a place where I could, I had a hard time settling for mediocre, so I lived with a lot of pressure on myself. My dad raised me to, to be a, uh, successful, to be a winner, but, you know, when, but when I didn't win, it was like my whole world was shattered. So I always had this whole pressure on me, so at the end, I felt... I felt really selfish, I felt preoccupied, I had a lot of fear of failure, and I was kind of driven, and life was sort of, you know, miserable. So partying and, and girls, it was a bunch of, you know, just relief. Um, and I went off to college, I stopped going to church, my mom was concerned about that, but then I told her, I said, well, mom, why do I need to go to church if God doesn't? I never met God at church. All I saw was candle lighting and stand up, sit down, turn the heart, and you know, do the holy hokey pokey, the holy pokey. <laughs> you know, and uh, it just didn't, it seemed like a bunch of ri religious ritual that didn't mean a whole lot to me. However, I could never get over the fact that uh, I just intuitively I knew that I was not an accident that this creation had a stamp of goodness and and beauty and I knew God was there but I felt like you ever seen that movie Home Alone you know like you wake up and you know where's the parents you know like it's like I, it's like I was aware that God was there but I, I was also aware that I did not know the God who was there and it was very frustrating to me because I remember one time as a Probably in middle school, junior high, uh, I, I took over a Sunday school class one time because the Sunday school teacher, you know, she started to do something. And then I said, whoa, wait, before you just jump into this canned thing, why don't, can we just get to the bottom line? How do you know if you're going to go to heaven or hell when you die? And then, oh, uh, 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 you know, and they, their answer was basically, you really can't. You try the best you can, then God judges you. And if you are, you know, mostly good, then you might have to go to purgatory for some time. And then, you know, eventually you might wind up in heaven. And so I made it my goal in life to be 51% good. <laughs> because most of the stuff I like to do was on the bad side. Then I went off on my own away from my parents and I lost all hope of ever getting the scale back to, to the 51% good. And that, without realizing it, even though what I was doing was wrong, losing hope that you could actually save yourself and make your, your life right with God is one of the best things that can happen for you. Jesus one time, he said, the tax collectors and the adulterers and the prostitutes are closer to the kingdom of heaven than you bozos. And he's talking to the religious leaders of the day because they were attempting to establish their own righteousness with God. Hey God, I'm right with you because of me. Right? And it, these people at least had lost all hope of standing right before God. And just think of it. 
you know, you're driving down the road and you're going 90 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour interstate, the police officer pulls you over and he says, you know how fast you're going? And you say, yeah, I'm sorry, I was going 90 miles an hour. You know what the speed limit is? Yes, 65. But, police officer, normally I drive the speed limit. I drove at the speed limit yesterday. So that should cancel out this right now, right? He'd look at you like, you're stupid. <laughs> of course not. See, I'm not, I'm not, you're doing good is what you're supposed to do. It doesn't give you any credit. That's just what you're supposed to do. And Jesus said the same thing in Luke chapter 17. He said, therefore you too, when you have done everything that God requires of you, you should, say, you should still say, I'm an unprofitable servant because I've only done what is required. There's nothing we could ever do that's going to erase something bad that we've done. People go to jail not because of all the stuff they did good. They go to jail because they broke laws, right? They committed murder. They stole. They did things like that. So it made a whole lot of sense to me uh, when I came home from a party one time. And I'm starting to pray before I go to bed. Um, just because I knew I had been doing things that I knew were wrong. I had been with a girl, I had been, you know, I'd drunk a six pack of beer, smoked a couple joints, done a half hit of acid, you know, and so I was at the point where I was like, you know, with me in control of my life, it just seemed so empty and fruitless, you know, it was like, it was getting to the point where being high didn't feel high and, you know, the downs were more and, you know, I was, I was starting to feel like, okay, I'm about to get on this slope because the stuff that I've been doing ain't doing it for me anymore. And if I keep going this direction, it's going to get ugly in a hurry. And I just, and I didn't want to go there. I, for the first time in my life, considered suicide and I was just kind of, for the first time in my life, instead of praying, you know, pr wrote prayers from memory that were just words coming across my lips, you know, our Father who art in heaven, I'll be the name, you know, that can be a great prayer when it's coming from your heart, but when you're just sitting there trying to get through a rosary, <laughs> it doesn't mean a whole lot. It's just, you know, putting in our time. <laughs> and, uh, but for the first time in my life, I was like, God, what is the point? Why am I so miserable? I know you're there. Religion hasn't taught me. I, I want to, what's going on? And I was not expecting God to bring up a chat box in my heart. You know, he hacked my computer and started speaking to me from my own thoughts. And, and I sensed the reality of God. And he's like, who do you think you're fooling? And I realized I wasn't fooling him. And he said, what good is it for you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? And I realized that was the problem. I was winning at the wrong stuff. The things that I was trying to succeed at. I knew God was there, but I was trying to use God for my life. And so I started to think, because I thought my life was mine. I stopped. There's a point where you just stopped acknowledging the fact you were created by someone else. They have a purpose and a plan for your life. So I started thinking, what, you know, how could I make this right? Uh, I started thinking, well, maybe I should try to turn over another leaf. I had run out of leaves, to be honest with you. I was, I was not good at turning over leaves. I'd turn them over and then I'd flip them back over, you know, <laughs> over, over, you know. It didn't, stay, it didn't stay right very quick. And so I wasn't really good at that. And so I started thinking, well, maybe I should try to go back to church and blah, blah, blah. And so I stopped praying and I started thinking. You ever do that? You know, you, you, you talk to God, He gives you some, some light, and then you stop talking to Him. You start trying to come up with your own solutions and your own plans. And thankfully, God, God was gracious enough, He jumped back in and said, If you try to save your life, you will lose it. <sighs> Sobered me up. But then He carried on His sentence, But if you will lose your life for me and the gospel... You will find life. I didn't realize that those were verses in the Bible. God was speaking to me from the inside. And He showed me what true faith was. See, up to that point, I thought, you know, I, of course I was a Christian. You know, you put a multiple choice, you know, Muhammad, Buddha, Hare Krishna, you know, some, you know, Vashni or what, whatever. You know, or, and Jesus, I'd have checked Jesus. I thought that makes me a Christian. 
Jesus said, many are going to say to me at the end, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons and prophesy in your name and do many miracles? And he's going to say, depart from me because I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. Your heart was lawless. And, you know, I, I, was, I was in that deception. I thought just because I would go to church sometimes on Sunday, that made me a Christian. Going to McDonald's don't make you a hamburger, right? <laughs> Going down, going in the garage don't make you a car. Going into a church doesn't make you Christian. You have to go to, into Christ and let Christ come into you. You have to be transformed. And so there was a point where I realized what true faith was. It was giving my life back to God through Jesus Christ. Putting my total trust in Him. That He came to live for me, die for me. I love it when somebody does the hard work for me. He lived the life I should have lived. A life of obedience, a life of faith, a life of love. He did it on my behalf and your behalf. Isn't that awesome? And then He died in our place to, to remove all the wrongs that we've done. And then He rose again from the dead. Now Jesus is Lord of all. He's alive. And we can surrender to Him, put our trust completely in Him. He gives us the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Actually, God's presence comes into us. A life that you and I weren't born with comes into us. You didn't get this from your mom and daddy. The life that raised Jesus from the dead. That supernatural divine life. That's why 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says that through the precious and magnificent promises of God, He has made us partakers of the divine nature. Wow. So we actually get to partake of the nature of God within us. Participate in God's life. I'm a host of another life form. Right? I'm a parasite. I suck my life out of somebody else. And you know what? I don't make him sick. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> so I'm trying to give you guys some metaphors, so don't be offended if, uh, if, if it kind of, you know, trips your triggers. I, I, I am, I do believe that God is holy. And I also believe He's given us pictures in this world so that we can understand and kind of relate to things, okay? So, uh, that was the point where yeah, literally that night I sat up and said, Yes, yes, God, I'll give my life to you and, and, and turn myself in. Entrust myself completely to you through Jesus. And He came into my life. Literally, I sat up in my bed. It was like 2.30 in the morning. I was like, Woo! I yelled out loud like that, you know, uh, because I, something had changed. I got up on the phone the next morning, like I was waiting for, for 9 o'clock to hit because my mom always told me don't call people before 9 o'clock. As soon as it went 8.59, it went 9. You know, I'm on the phone. I called an old girlfriend who was much too Christian for me at the time, so I, you know, date and stopped dating her. I said, hey, you know, do you have an extra Bible? I, I don't know, but I think I just became a real Christian last night. And, and she was like, oh, Andy, I, was like, I just want the Bible. I ain't getting back together with you, you know? Anyway, so she met me. She gave me this old King James Bible, and I started reading in the New Testament. I started with Matthew. Then after, I started noticing that I would just read, and it was like, there was... I'd feel these lurches, you know, like it was like all of a sudden the Spirit of God lives in this Word and it was like there was a connection. It's like, you know, who's this inside of me? Whoever's inside of me is, in, is the God of this book. And, you know, it was just amazing. And, and so, to make a long story short, God transformed my life. I, I just instantly... I lost a desire for drugs and I didn't I didn't intentionally like set out you know like that wasn't my main thing but here's the cool thing I realized when you have peace inside of you you don't have to put stuff in you to get it when you have happiness and joy through the Spirit of God which is where we're supposed to get it you don't have to put stuff in you to numb you you don't have to put stuff in you to, to get that. Your body eventually will start telling you, look, dude, I was not intended to be the source of your peace. Stop putting that junk in me. You gotta, but our souls are crying out for happiness, for joy, for peace, for life, aren't we? Here's why. Because it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image. What does that mean? God got a goatee? No, he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that's Jesus. <laughs> so, 
here, here's the thing, all right? God made human beings in His image, kind of like a glove is in the image of a hand, right? Why do you make a glove with four fingers and a thumb? Because it was made to contain a hand, right? It was made in the image of what it's designed to contain. You and I are made in the image of God. And do you notice when babies come into the world, they come into the world empty? They got a mind, but it's empty. They don't know anything. But it's, it's, it functions best when it operates and is filled with truth and wisdom. Amen? Amen. Uh, our hearts, they desire peace and joy and love, don't they? But we're always looking for that. We look for love from the people around us. We look for peace. You know, we look for joy, don't we? We pursue those things. Why? We were hardwired to pursue those things. Because we were created empty to contain God. You know, you, you can't stick a plug into the side of the wall. You've got to fit, fit it into the outlet. And so there's a, there's a socket, there's a receptor that's made for what it's meant to plug into. And you and I, our hearts desire love and peace. Our minds need truth and wisdom. Our wills desperately need direction, don't we? And you and I were made to contain the Spirit of God, but we became uh, detached and unplugged. And so we started trying to fill ourselves with stuff other than God. We get other ideas, deception. We get a lack of wisdom, which is foolishness. We get Instead of getting peace and joy and happiness, we can't get that from out here, can we, guys? We can't get it. We, it you know, it seems like you found love. And then you plug into them and they plug into you and you find out you got two empty receptacles trying to suck electricity out of one another and neither one of you got power. And, and after you get, get done with the, the physical plugging in, you find out that the, that the relational and emotional plugging in, it didn't work. I thought you was finally going to be different. And you find out that you're just as empty as they are and they're just as empty as you are. Why? Because we were meant to find our life, our joy, our peace, our wisdom, our truth, our stability in God. Amen? Amen. So, that's what, what I want to talk about in our times together. So here's how I plan to use our time. Is in the morning times, I want to talk about things that are going to help you in your personal walk with God. And then in the evenings, I'm going to talk about uh, how God can use you and flow through you in terms of miracles, healing, signs and wonders, uh, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now, if that sounds freaky to you, it won't by, by the time I've got to lay a foundation, okay? Um, here's the thing that's awesome. Think of it this way. God really wants to fill you. And Jesus is the first man who came filled with God, the very Son of God. Amen? And so he said, it's not me doing my works, but my Father who dwells in me. He did all that so that he could die, rise again, and put his Spirit inside of you so that now he can fill you and you can live like a Son of God. So that he can live not just in you, but live through you to help others. That's the amazing thing. And for a long time, I, didn't, I thought, you know, that's Jesus stuff. Jesus does all that amazing stuff. But Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, He said, Whoever believes in Me, the works I do, He'll do also and even greater because I go to the Father. Wow. So He believes He can do His works through you. He believes that. Any believer, not just super anointed people, you know, people with television programs, white suits, and Rolex watches, and wives with emotional instability. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry, Jim. No. <laughs> I'm just playing, man. I love you. You know, it's called brotherly love. Sometimes brotherly love looks funny. All right. I didn't mean that. <laughs> They're going to get me later, I'm sure. All right. So here's what I want to focus in on. Uh, I want to focus in on living as new creations in Jesus Christ. Um, and and you all know the verse, hopefully, uh, that I'm going to be anchoring in. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
verse 17, says something really important. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God. Right? Uh, it goes on at 18. Now, uh, this, this is really important because I learned this verse not very long after I became a Christian. Um, but I didn't start experiencing the reality of this verse and really come to understand it until much later. And I wish I would have had this as a foundation that I could experience the old is gone and the new has come. And if we can enter into that experience that the old is gone, because many of you know sometimes stuff that happened long time ago, when you think about what's got you messed up, it's the stuff that happened a long time ago. But if you can enter into the old, that's the old. That's got no power on me. That's got nothing to do with me because that's the old and through Jesus, it's gone. Because the new has come. And, I have, and I'm living in newness that I've received through Jesus Christ. I have a new life. I have a new mindset. I have a new purpose. I have a new destiny. I have a new identity. All that's new and it's mine. And I'm walking in that. That's what I want to try to get us to so that you can see that. So uh, let's, let's look at how this verse starts. The first word is the word therefore, if anyone is in Christ. So good news, whenever you see the word therefore, what do you do? You look and see what it's there for, right? So this is, this is building on something else. And so you go look at the verse before there. It says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. Mean, what does that mean? People have a way of sort of evaluating one another and getting to know one another, right? Uh, they, you know, first impressions, how do they look? Uh, you know, how do they talk? Do they seem nice? That kind of thing. Oh, you know, and a lot of people have a fleshly way of knowing Jesus Christ. Uh, the apostles that walked with Him, they knew Him according to the flesh, but he, that knowledge according to the flesh then disappeared when Jesus ascended back into the heavens, right? So you're not going to have a fleshly knowledge of Jesus Christ. That is no longer. Jesus said, blessed are you because you see, uh, you see and believe, but blessed are those who do not see and believe. So now we're like Paul. We're knowing Jesus Christ according to the Spirit, and remember, Jesus, sometimes we used to, I used to think, man, if I could just have been around, and Je like, why, didn't, why did Jesus ascend to the heavens? Why didn't He just sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, you know? So instead of all these, you know, proofs for the existence of God and, and all this stuff of, you know, people doubting, we could just say, look on your television. The Jesus channels got Him like, you know, you know, a 24-7 view live of Jesus, healing people right in front of your eyes day after day after day. Or why didn't God just write in the stars, Jesus is Lord? He could have done that. But you know, God didn't design this universe to try to prove His existence. God's not trying to prove Himself. He just created to demonstrate His heart and His mind. He designed this universe to con as, as a container, a house for us who would be a container of Him. Right? You ever notice that sometimes when you're trying to prove yourself, you're not really yourself? <laughs> you ever notice that Jesus, every time that people wanted Him to prove Himself, He said, buzz off? You know? Show us a sign! Nope. And then, then they'd leave and then He'd start healing people again. Right? He said, I'm not interested in proving myself to you. See, you're creator. You're creature. I'm creator. I, I don't, I, I'm not subjecting myself to your, to your evaluation. I, I, I created you for a relationship. So if you want to know me as myself, stop demanding that I perform for you. I'm not circ a circus monkey. 
right? And a lot of times we make the mistake of testing God and say, God, if you're real, if you're there, you know, and sometimes He'll be gracious and answer those prayers just because He wants, wants to make his, Himself known to us, right? But a lot of times people are like, God, do it this way or else. And God doesn't negotiate with terrorists. You can, <laughs> you can hold yourself hostage if you want. I will only love you if you will do things my way. And God's basically saying to you, I can't love you if I do things your way. Meaning, the only way for me to truly love you is to continue to be myself and to bring you into my way, not for me to get onto your way. Right? He doesn't raise spoiled children. He's a good father. Right? You can cry your little temper tantrums for all you want and hold your breath till you turn blue in the face. God is trying to raise you up to be like Him. And He's putting His wisdom, His love, His grace, His mercy into you. And so the sooner we begin to cooperate and trust His heart and to know His heart, the better it is. So here's the thing. People knew Jesus according to the flesh. And sometimes, he says, we used to know Jesus that way. We don't know Him that way any longer. But now we don't know anyone that way. We don't even know ourselves according to the flesh. And sometimes we have a fleshly knowledge of ourselves. Well, if people say, well, tell me about you. you have, sometimes people have this feeling of shame or guilt or inferiority come over them because they're depending on who they're talking to because they, they, may, they may or may not feel really good about themselves. Has anybody in here ever, ever struggled with feeling like you have like low self-esteem or a bad self-image? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of hands go up, you know. And, and here's the good news. Here's the good news. Instead of trying to improve your self-image, what if you just realize God never created you to have an independent image from Him? He actually created you to contain His image. And so He wants to give Himself to you to fill you to say, everything that you are is me. I am one with you through Jesus Christ. See, Jesus said, every time, Jesus, every time people wanted to celebrate Jesus, say, man, you're amazing. He said, listen, it's my Father living in me doing His works. So He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? And so he, even His disciples, you know, He said, you know, in John 14, I think it was Philip or one of them said, Lord, just show us the Father. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you and you've not known me? He said, from now on, you do know me and you have seen him. Uh, Lord, we were just asking you to show us the Father and now you're saying from now on, we do know him and have seen him. See, what he's trying to do, he said, look, sometimes we miss God because we're trying to know him according to the flesh. We want some experience of God where he comes down with, you know, powerful clouds of glory that just, you know, gives us a little electric zap. You know, we can feel it and we can, we can see it. We can hear it with our eyes. And because we're used to relating to God, we're relating, relating to everybody according to the flesh. And Jesus is saying, and that's what the disciples are saying. Lord, just do us glory zap, you know, or show us the Father. You know, like, because they did see, you know, like he went up on the mountain, Mount of Transfiguration. All of a sudden, phew, he's shining, glowing like a light bulb for a little bit. Moses did this, you know, he had that face all covered in glory. But Jesus, he said, from now on, you have seen him because he who has seen me has seen the Father. Right? That's how we know Jesus. We know Jesus. He is the one who contains the Father. The Father has come to us in the Son. Amen? He's, he's made us to be His image bearers. Jesus came as the image of God. So He becomes our clear lens of knowing our Father. And, but we have to shift our mindset. We have to decide from now on, I know Him. I know God. He's not, I'm not, I'm not, you, you heard the thing, you know, you got uh, four guys blindfolded feeling different parts of the elephant, you know, and each one has a little part. You heard that one? No? Sometimes people are like, God is just so big that none of us can really see Him or understand Him. And they use this example, like there was, there was uh, four men uh, that, that had to reach through a hole and they were trying to feel and decide what this thing was. And one grabbed hold of the tusk of the elephant 
elephant and said, well, God is, God is like narrow and really hard and pointy. And then another one, you know, felt his side and said, no, he's like scratchy and, and, and just broad as far as you can, can reach. And then another one grabbed hold of his tail and like it's skinny and furry, you know. Uh, you know, you get the idea. Then they decide, you know, that and that was used as an illustration, how God just too big. None of us can truly understand. But the truth of it, those people were all blind and they were in darkness. And Jesus said that those who uh, follow him will not live in darkness, but they will have the light of life. Jesus said the pure in heart will see God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we have a definite, clear, unmistakable revelation of God. He's a healer. He forgives sinners. He restores our destiny. He hung on the cross while we were yet a sinner. Stop looking at your circumstances to tell how God feels about you today. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. When you were at your worst, He loved you the most. Amen. So you're not going to get Him to love you more by trying harder. He, His love for you is not provoked by your goodness. His love for you is provoked by His own goodness. Amen? Now here's the cool thing about it. Jesus said, unless you're born of the Spirit, unless you're born of God, unless you're born from above, born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. But what does that imply? Once you are born again, what can you do? See the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Not necessarily with your eyes, but on the inside, your gut. I can't unsee who God is. I can't unsee His love for me. It's like, don't you see it? Like, you know, if people who are looking through the flesh, like, oh, I, I don't see it. What do you mean? Show me a glory cloud and electric zap. You know. <laughs> but it's different. So when you said, Lord Jesus, I give my life to you. Forgive me. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Make me new. The Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead goes and so now there's like this extension cord from heaven called the Holy Spirit that all of the power and the fullness and the peace and the joy and the love and the very nature of Jesus Christ plugs into your innermost being and Jesus said that he was speaking of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7 where he said on the last day I think it's John chapter 7 verse 37 39 he said on the last and great day of the feast he says if any man is thirsty let him come to me and out of their inmost being will flow rivers of living water and it says this he spoke of the Holy Spirit but the Holy Spirit was not yet given because, the Holy, because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, Jesus said, once I'm with the Father, then I can do my works through whoever believes in me. Why? Because I can, all the Spirit, all the authority, all the love that's in me. Jesus in John chapter 17, He said, Father, the glory that you've given me, I give to them. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4 says this, When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with Him in glory. So God is spirit. He does not know you according to the flesh. He took on flesh so that He could become one with our life form. Amen? So that He, in His, in His humanity, could... Uh, conquer sin, death, and evil. And He went to the cross and it says when He died, all died. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14. For, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. Do you understand that? That's why uh, Galatians 2.20, Paul says this personally for him, but it's true for us. I have been crucified with Christ. You know, Jesus isn't the only one that died upon that cross. When Jesus was dying, He was carrying you and me inside of Him. He was representing all humanity to the Father. He became one with the likeness of our sinful flesh by actually taking our nature onto Him. 
But he never sinned. He committed no sin. There was no deceit found in his mouth. And then he humbled himself to offer himself as our representative. And when he died, you and I died in him. He said, Father, do not punish them. I offer myself as a sacrifice on their behalf. And the Father said, okay, I'll let you represent them to me. And so when we realize Jesus not only died for us, He died as us. So all of the anger, all of the righteous indignation of God, the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins was met at that day. And that day, you and I died. Everything that we are apart from God was crucified. And that's good. Because here's what I want you to understand. The old is gone. The old does not get improved. Right? How many of you have spent uh, time trying to use the Bible to improve yourself? And trying to use the Holy Spirit and trying to use Jesus and trying to use prayer. And we're thinking of ourselves of, oh, I'm broken. I'm messed up. I've I got all these things. I got these addictions. I got these temptations. I got these hang-ups. I got these triggers. And we're and we think that the triggers and the hang-ups and the addictions and the and the stuff is us. And we know ourselves according to the flesh. And God knew who we were apart from Him. And He chose to love us and become one with us us and represent us and then he went to the cross and he's, he's not trying to improve you anymore good news he took you out back and shot you so he could give you a new you amen, amen? amen. i mean that's what people who are who are tempted to suicide think they realize the problem is in me it's who i am and i'm trying to escape from me and they think that somehow on the other side of death is freedom. And there is a reality to that in this sense that, you know what? Once, once, once somebody's died, their problems have died with them. You know, if you had a bunch of bills, bill collectors can't come into your coffin and say, Hey, dude, pay up! <laughs> right? The problems in this world died with you. I've got good news for you. You died with Christ. All of your issues that you feel like you have to improve, He said there's no improving it. Let it die. Let it die. Let it die with me. Because that's not who you are. That's not who I created you to be. That's not who you are. See, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you my life as your life. You, know, you ever watch them Walt, uh, Walt Disney movies, you know, where like all of a sudden, you know, a, a man is inside the dog, dog body, you know, <laughs> or, or the dog's in the man. You know, it, it's, it's weird because they, they exchange innards. And God put the innards of himself in us through the Holy Spirit. So now we can actually partake of the divine nature. That's why it says, therefore, if any man is inside of Christ, do you know God looks in the Son before Him and sees Jesus containing you, the real you? Because Colossians 3, 4 says, when Christ who is our life is revealed, God says Christ is your life. Now this is important because if I were to, uh, to ask you before you knew this was a trick question, if I were to ask you, hey, tell me about your relationship with God, some of you might start talking to me about, uh, about temptations, about prayer, about you know, things you're learning in the Word. You know, well, I, I've been struggling to have a regular time with God. And, I've been, you know, and you, you tell me about your walk with God. Because, and here's the, where the mistake is, is you start basing your relationship with God on your walk with Him. And if you is really, really good, and then that puts you on the hook, right? The pressure is all on you about, uh, about having your relationship with God. But here, here's what I would encourage you, is realize that God has given you the relationship that He has with Jesus as your relationship with Him.
So you get to step into Jesus' relationship with the Father, His standing with the Father, His righteousness, His perfection, all the love that the Father has for Him, that the Father's pouring out His delight on the Son, right? And you're inside the Son. You're wearing your Jesus suit in the presence of the Father. And here's the cool thing. Jesus is like a really leaky roof. So everything the Father pours into Jesus just totally splashes onto you, right? So, I love you, son. Yeah! I delight in you. Yeah! You're so righteous. Yeah! That is your spirit. That's your spirit. That's where you get life from. And that's fixed. That's solid. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. See, the old creation, God took dust of the ground and he breathed life. And Adam became a living soul, right? But in 1 Corinthians, it says that the first Adam was a living soul. But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, became a life-giving spirit. Do you see the difference? See, we don't live by soul life anymore. Detached from God. There was... Adam was able to enjoy the presence of God outside of him, but he was not yet, he didn't take the tree of life so that the life of God could come into him and become one with him, right? Jesus has become the tree of life. So now we receive him. Here's the thing that's awesome. Here's what I want you to understand. All of those things that you feel like you've been carrying around, what if you release those to Jesus by faith? What if you allowed His crucifixion to tell you, I love you and that does not define you. And all of that stuff that has power over you, to manipulate you, to control you, to shape you. What if the reality of that is I let all that stuff come against me. I was tortured. I was held down, pierced through, naked. And nobody believed me. Some of you have been touched wrong. Jesus was touched wrong. Some of you have been humiliated. Jesus was humiliated. Some of you have been disbelieved and devalued. Jesus was disbelieved and devalued. You ha that happened to you against your will. Jesus walked into that willingly because He knew that's where you were at. And He, and that stuff, held you down and oppressed you and, and brought you under that power. Jesus broke its power. It never got its grip on Him. He's hanging on the cross. People are mocking Him and He's saying, Father, forgive them. Now, here's the cool thing about that. That is your life. That is your life, the life of Christ. And you may not feel like you can do it out here because that's been the way that you've been used to trying to deal with it. But what if you let it all go and turn to Him in the Spirit and allow, uh, received His strength and His freedom into your heart, into, into your mind, instead of trying to look to your circumstances and other people to give you peace and happiness and a sense of worth. Why don't you receive Jesus Christ and know yourself, I am worth dying for to God. He gave all of Himself to me. And I will withhold nothing. He is my safe place. Amen? Some people... They have a lot of power, but you really shouldn't trust them. You can't trust them because of what they've got in them. God showed He's got all the power in the world, and He does not want to reject you. He wants to bless you. He wants to restore you because you were never created to be alone. So here's what I tell people. How does, how does this affect yourself? You know how perfect Jesus is in the love that the Father and the Son share with one another. How do they do that? In the Spirit, right? Guess what? Now, you get to step into Christ and you get to allow the Spirit of the Son to flow through your heart to the Father and the Father flows to you, loving you on the inside. You've got to allow it to become real by faith. You've got to decide, I do know the Father. He knows me. I'm born again. I'm His Son. Jesus is my relationship with the Father. So now we base our walk with God on our relationship with Him. So if we take a stumble, guess what? I brought my kids home from the hospital. They were mine. They were my children 
forever. Whether they were smart or not smart, whether they were popular or not popular, whether they listened to everything that I said or not, they were mine. Why? Because my DNA is in them. Does that make sense? You're born of God. Jesus said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I know my sheep. And my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I hold them in my hand and no one can snatch them from my hand. Isn't that good? He's got a grip on you. Your relationship with God does not depend on your walk with Him. You can walk out your relationship with Him because God has given you the relationship that Jesus has with Him. See that? Now, how do you experience that? Most of us, when we go into the presence of God, we're very sin conscious and self conscious and circumstance conscious and need conscious, aren't we? You know? Lord, I'm all messed up. Please forgive me. Thank you for, for Jesus, you know, but help me to fix this and this and this and all these things that, that are wrong with me. Okay? Or, Lord, these people around here are driving me crazy. Please help them not to drive me crazy so I can be nice. <laughs> and so, it, here's the thing. If you're trying, if, if you need other people and circumstances to prop up your soul, you're not free yet. You're still giving other people authority over your soul to manipulate you. You know, how people treat you. They might treat you with disrespect. But if you're not getting your worth from other people, then you can be free. Right? Jesus didn't get His worth from us. He knew Himself after the Spirit, didn't He? I mean, He was terribly mistreated. His disciples were not getting it even to the very end. But He didn't have all this pressure to try to make things happen. He, he lived from this solid stability in His relationship with the Father. He said, the Father knows me. The Father loves me. I have the Father's approval. Paul said the same thing. Look, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be in a, a bondservant of Christ. I speak a, a according to pl what pleases God, not what, a, what pleases man. And so that sets us free when God knows us. Five minutes? Yep. All right. So... Here's what I want to encourage you to do. How many of you, when you go into the presence of the Father, go in as a son? Step into Jesus' relationship and put on your Jesus suit and let all of His perfections just shine. You just wear it. You look good on it. In it. Amen? And just let the Spirit of the Son, loving the Father, sharing delight, being delighted in you're as loved by the Father as Jesus is. Right? And so I wear my Jesus suit, kind of like, kind of like Jacob. If you know the story, there, Jacob wanted to get, he was supposed to get the inheritance of the father uh, of, of Isaiah, Isaac, right? Uh, but Isaac like Esau. Esau was the older brother. Esau, like, he was like Duck Dynasty. He liked to hunt and cook the, the venison. He smelled, you know, had a beard, hair on his back probably. Um, and then, uh, but Jacob, he was kind of a mama's boy. He, you know, he liked to do interior decorating and help figure out what mama cooks and stuff like that. So his father kind of like, you know, the manly man, you know, but Jacob was one that was supposed to get the blessing. And so they heard about this. The father said, you know, I'll bless you, when you to Esau when you go and, and uh, shoot something and fix me the stew I like. So here's the thing. Jacob got the firstborn's blessing. How did he do it? His mom said, go out and get a couple goats and kill them. And then go to the dirty clothes hamper, get your brother's stinky robe, put it on. And so the mom made the stew. And then they took the fur and they put it on, on the hands because Esau was a hairy guy. They put it on the back of his neck. And Jacob went into the father's presence to get blessed with the firstborn's blessing by wearing the firstborn. Right? He put the firstborn on. Now, he did it illegally by deception. You and I, but that's a picture of us in Jesus Christ. We go into the presence of the Father wearing the firstborn, His righteousness, His perfection, His love, His standing. And then, guess what? The Father said to Jacob, said, Is that you, my firstborn? Well, then come close. And He gave him a hug. And he smelled. 
you know, that was a bad fragrance. But for us, we give off the fragrance of Christ to God. It's a pleasant aroma. And He feels the back of our neck. And necks often are symbolic for um, your obedience, right? Jesus Christ obeyed the Father perfectly. He, when, God, when they would disobey, they'd call Him stiff-necked people, right? When the king was conquered, uh, they would have the king, they would, they would put their foot on the back of their neck, you know, to show you're in total submission to me, right? Jake, the, he wore fur on the back of his neck. He presented the back of his hands. The Father felt the fur. You and I get to present the obedience of Jesus Christ to the Father. We get to present the work of His hands. We get to present the finished work, the stew. And then guess what? We get blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And when we learn to be in the Father's presence, letting Jesus be our all in all, letting enjoying the Father uh, just like the Son and being just as welcomed and just as loved, it transforms us on the inside. And then not only do I wear my Jesus suit in the presence of God, Jesus wears His Andy suit as we go through our day. Do you see that? So I want to encourage you, the next time you have time alone with God, step into the, the Son in the Father's presence. And I'm not saying that you can't talk about to God about the things that are troubling you, but I'm saying make a lot of room for, letting, for enjoying the presence of the Father and letting the Father enjoy you in His presence. Because most of us have never experienced a healthy connection with people in authority. We've never known what it is to be a complete delight to somebody. And let the Father delight in you. Because He puts His arms around you and says, My son is back. My daughter is back. Bring the best robe. Amen? And we need to get settled in that. Because it will flush out of us some really yucky stuff. Amen?